Wong's distinctive voice from the first memoir, Fresh Off the Boat, or maybe from his vice show, Wong's World, or maybe even tasted Bao from his spot in New York, Bao House, which we hear, maybe soon, might have a West Coast counterpart. His new book, Double Cup Love, On the Trail of Family, Food, and Broken Hearts in China, is Wong's plunge into a wild travel adventure in China on a quest for answers to the questions for which we know him best. He unpacks those questions of identity, culture, and in this book, love, as he tastes his way through red pork, Chinese hot pot, fish balls, and also through new friendships and other cultural escapades in the motherland. How do Chinese people see him as a Chinese Taiwanese American? Where does his identity most fit in? China, New York City, or what about Scranton, Pennsylvania, home of his lady friend, Dina? And what does it say to his Asian-ness that he's head over heels for a white girl? Does any of it really matter? No doubt we will find out tonight, because if there's one thing we know about Eddie Wong, it is that he is not afraid to call it like it is in the fresh, bold, saucy voice of someone hungry to know more. Joining him in conversation tonight is Constance Wu, the breakout star of the TV series, Fresh Off the Boat. <laughs> which is based on Wong's first memoir, which just wrapped its second season. Her role as Eddie's mom, Jessica Wong, garnered her the Television Critics Association and Critics' Choice Television Award nominations for her work in a prime time comedy that is changing the face of TV. Identity is something she is no stranger to either. Wu has been a vocal advocate for speaking out about the need to see more Asian Americans in Hollywood. A lover, <laughs> a lover of language and literature, Wu recently said in a New York Times interview, I'm one of those people who thinks there's nothing more human than a book. What better person than to have Constance Wu here to chat all things double cup love with author Eddie Wong on the allowed stage at the Aratani Theater. Let's give it up for our guests. This is, this is my favorite like five pages in the book. And uh, I really enjoy reading this because it's about my middle brother Emery and he moved back to China after I wrote this book, and he lives in Chengdu now, and so cats don't really see him much. They always see me and my youngest brother, Evan, at Bauhaus, so um, yeah, I'd like to give Emery his due. My earliest memories are from 1985. I don't have many memories before that year, but I remember 1985. I was excited. My mom was making me a friend. He's gonna be more than a friend, my mom said. He's your brother. Is that the best friend you can have, I asked? Absolutely, brother is best friend you will ever have. But you fight with your brother all the time. I, uh, Eddie, you little monster, I can't hide anything from you. <laughs> Mom thought to herself for a second, then explained it to me. I love my family, but we're not the best example. It was hard for our generation. Some born in China, some in Taiwan. Everyone come to America have to learn new things. Life was hard, but you and your brother have to stick together, okay? Okay. Promise? Promise. In the weeks leading up to the birth, I hung on every word she told me about brothers. She told me a story about two brothers having a harmless fight in the kitchen that spilled over to the basement. One brother tumbled down the stairs and hit his head on a nail. He died. <laughs> she kept telling me morbid stories about brothers fighting to the death in preparation for my brother Emery's arrival. It freaked me out, but I was still excited. I wanted a best friend. Dad didn't say much about Emery, but that didn't surprise me. He was always working late, and I was asleep by the time he got home. When I woke up, he was already going back to work. Why is Dad so mean, Mom? Your dad isn't mean. He's under a lot of stress. Business isn't good. Is that why he yells at you? Eddie, when me and Dad fight, don't pay attention. You guys are loud. <laughs> so nosy. Next time you hear us fight, you go to sleep, OK? I didn't understand my dad back then, and therefore I didn't like him. <laughs> but on March 7, 1985, <laughs> everything changed. 
Emery was born. Dad came home from the hospital and picked me up. I remember he was very stern. Eddie, let's go see your mom. Is mom in the hospital? Yeah, she just had your brother. Oh, cool, what's he look like? He's big, nine pounds, 10 ounces, fat baby. <laughs> awesome, he's gonna be tall. Yeah, right. He loves saying, yeah, right. We got in our Chevy Malibu station wagon and went off to the hospital. I didn't say anything to my dad. He didn't say anything to me. I just stared out the window at the trees. I like the trees in Northern Virginia. Passing now in a blur as we drove up and down the hills, it felt like we were on a roller coaster. And then we pulled into a drugstore. I thought we were going to the hospital. We need to make a stop here. Let's go. Okay. My dad walked in the store and I walked alongside him. He wasn't the kind of dad who'd hold your hand or pat your head. He was more like a boss. I just followed his lead whenever he was around. Eddie, pick any toy you want. Really? Yeah, but only one toy. What'd I do? What do you mean? Did I do something good? No, not really. <laughs> I was suspicious. Was this a trap? My dad never did anything nice. <laughs> <laughs> Even my mom never got toys, but something was wrong. Why am I getting a toy then? He was hiding something from me. I remember he looked away and didn't make much eye contact. Eddie, dad will always love you. I didn't understand. He just kept staring at the wall of toys. If I was with my mom, I'd be bouncing off the wall, picking through the toys, but I was careful around my dad. He always told me to walk straight, stand straight, chest out. I stood there as stiff as I could and stared at the wall with him. <laughs> then he spoke. Shao Wen, and this was my first Chinese name, Shao Wen, before the fortune teller changed it twice. <laughs> Your brother Emery is born today, but I want you to remember what I tell you. No matter what happens, no matter how much we love your brother, it doesn't change how we feel about you. Mom and dad will always love you, okay? Nothing will ever change that. I know. How do you know? I shrugged. Really, you aren't worried we may like Emery more? <laughs> no, I never thought about it. Emery's supposed to be my best friend. Huh, who told you that? Mom, hmm, she's right. You have a good mom. I didn't know she already told you this. Yeah, I wanna go meet Emery. Okay, we'll pick a toy and then we go see Emery. I knew exactly which toy I wanted. Dad, I want that green He-Man car. But there was one problem with that choice. <laughs> Just as my dad went to grab it, I spoke up. But I don't have a He-Man, Dad. <laughs> he wasn't falling for it. You want the car or you want a He-Man? <laughs> I want the car. You sure? This is what Americans call put the car before the He-Man. Yeah, I want the car. Why do you want the car? The car is green, I like green, plus it's bigger. He-Man is just a man. Huh, okay, here's your car. He handed me the car. 32 years later, it's still here. The green He-Man car, driven by a belief in unconditional love between father and son. Despite everything that's happened between us, I see myself as privileged. My dad stopped the world on March 7, 1985 to remind me that he loved me, and I'll never forget it. I told myself that I'd take care of Emery the same way my dad took care of me. And in a way, I succeeded. I do treat Emery like dad treated me. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of cutting jokes and cheap shots sprinkled with random acts of kindness. got questions oh boy <laughs> I'm not used to being the one like asking questions so I like did homework to prepare uh, I uh, what your book essentially is about I mean it's called double cup love um, and I read it and I really think it talks about identity culture and love whether it's romantic love or love in your family and how those elements um, inform each other and sometimes are in conflict with each other. Um, there's a quote from your book where you said, people talk about escape, but I don't believe in traveling for the purpose of forgetting. I travel to find myself again. I think in your first book, Fresh Off the Boat, it was very much about how you sort of found yourself in New York. Um, and through your childhood, that's how you found your identity. And in Double Cup Love, you make the journey to China. 
Um, and I wanted to ask you, was there like a crystallizing moment and an impetus that made you decide that that was sort of like the next chapter of your identity and exploration? Yeah, that's a really good question. You're starting off well. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. You know, the thing is, is that Fresh Off the Boat, like as you know, is, it, was, it was about our family coming to America, creating our place in America, surviving here. But along the way, you know, Dominant culture, America, Americans at times didn't make it very easy for us, and our lives be, be our lives became reactions. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's a very reactive book. It's very emotional. It's passionate and it's angry. But then what happened is 2013 we published the book. It was very well received, and then I had to deal with something new because I'd always been a fighter. I'd always been the underdog, and all of a sudden I was accepted, and. I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know what to do when I wasn't fighting against something. Did it almost make you suspicious? Yeah. Because it, it does me, that to me. I'm just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it made me suspicious. It also made me feel like, what am I going to do not as an underdog? I don't know how to be anything else. Like, I'm not used to people saying nice things. I'm not very good at taking compliments. I'm not used to not fighting and not having this chip on my shoulder. And I started to hang on to it. And this book is very much about allowing yourself to get lost, allowing yourself to be accepted, and allowing yourself to be loved, you know? Because it's very hard when you just never thought it was going to happen. And especially when I think so much of your identity is informed by struggle. And, you know, it's like, you know how they say, like, when a band has, like, a great first album that they've spent, like, their whole lives working on, then they have huge success, and they have to, like, do a second album in a year, and the second album is just not as good. I'm not yeah, saying this yeah, isn't as no, good. Yeah, no, I feel like Outkast, like, the only group that had a good second album, you know? Yeah, like, no, it's true. It's the, it's the yeah. sophomore slump. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, well, yeah, no, it's, it's tough. It's tough because your identity was this thing. And then when you do well, it's taken away from you. And they're like, do it again without this now. And you're like, wait, what? Well, this is you know? a great... But it's a good thing, right? Like, you got to shed your skin. Well, it's good, but it's also tough. And I think people don't give credit to that. I mean, just even having to do with our show on ABC, Fresh Off the Boat. Um, you know, I was listening to ta Coates' Allowed series he did. And he was talking about how the education system he feels largely actually teaches compliance. And I think you and I both got an education in network and studio television in that the reason they bought your property and wanted to make it is because you were a non-compliant voice. You were interesting and loud and you weren't afraid to be yourself. But yet, once they took your life story and made it into something that didn't quite fit with how you felt um, your experience was, I feel like not just this network, but also a lot of the public sort of uh, chastise you for non-compliance. And it's just like, why are you getting mad at somebody for like the very reason that you found them? Like, it's like, are, this, this is just another form of dominant culture saying, wow, you struggled so hard that you got your voice out there and you were great and you defied all these barriers. Now let's try to mold you into part of this thing. And it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's still a struggle, but I, I almost feel like it probably was a lot more lonely. Yeah, 2015 sucked. Yeah, <laughs> for me too. You know, yeah, 2015 was terrible. You know, we went through it together. And, and I, I think you're totally right. Is It's very weird when, you know, you put it on your back and you broke out and you did not suture your voice and you didn't compromise and you succeeded. And then people tell you they love what you did, they love what you wrote, but hey, let's make it comply with the standard ideas of Asian America and Asians, and let's make sure that we create now a story on television that doesn't shock people too much, that doesn't challenge them too much, so that they will watch it. And you know, the thing I've been telling people is, it's almost offensive to dominant culture middle America, because when I meet Americans and, and people of other cultures, white people, it, no one's ever like, hey, can you give me like the shittier version of your story? Because it assumes you they're know? stupid and yeah. uninterested. Yeah. And, and that's not, the best writing is you're not assuming your audience is stupid. Yeah. You are just 
writing from the heart and you assume that they'll, un not everybody will understand like you, you, but the right people will understand yeah. you. Your people will but understand But I think you. all people want to know the truth. That's the thing. It's like if I go to a Chinese restaurant with people who aren't Chinese, no one's ever like, hey, can you order this stuff that like you think I'm going to like? And they're like, no, just bring it. Show me. I want to learn. And I think that this generation of Americans is much more open to diversity. They want it. It's the politicians. It's the system. It's the networks. It's the media that tries to continue to divide us because the powers that be, we've always known, you make money by dividing and conquering the barbarians. You make money by segmenting people and keeping them apart. Thank you, yeah. And I just think people in general, we want to know what it's like in each other's homes. We want to know about each other's food. We want to know about each other's culture. But th the beautiful thing is this. It's like you broke out on that show. That show has touched a lot of people, and it's been a gateway. And I'm proud of it. I'm proud of what it does. You know, I don't watch it, but I'm very proud of it. And, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's we're on base, and other people got to keep doing it. You're doing other movies, like, I'm always so excited when I see you doing other things because it's all Asian American creativity. It's all immigrant art. And, and soon, in a couple of generations, maybe people will just see it as American or human. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really want to get to is that people who are different, we get to be seen as whole people, not as like this thing. Yeah. And, you know, your show was, I mean, I'm going to say some embarrassing stuff about myself now, but you know, when you first met me, I was very much in denial about my Asian American identity. Um, and I'm not proud of that. In fact, a little embarrassed of it. But it, it wasn't because I had ill intentions. It was because I think my form of struggling against dominant culture was sort of wanting to be the exception to the rule, wanting to be the person who somehow fit into white society, which is understandable because systemically we're shown that those are the institutions of power and of meaning. So I wanted to fit, and those are the stories in Hollywood that have a beginning, middle, and end. You don't have, you don't gotta be ashamed either. I think it's but really it beautiful. But it took me time to yeah. get to this. I remember place. on set we talked about it like the first day, and I was like, I don't know, nothing. Yeah. Like, I, it doesn't affect me at all. I'm just a person. I'm yeah, like, you were like, I'm an actor. I'm an actor. I'm just, and I was all like, all I right, do is act. Right. Nothing. I, I was. And I remember much. saying to myself, I was like, she doesn't know what she signed up for. <laughs> I was like, you went for a ride. And uh, you know what, though? You have taken on the responsibility in a way like I don't think anybody was ready for. You know, and, and you've right. taken it on. Thanks. You've been fighting the good fight. It's it's a beautiful thing to watch. And I think there are a lot of Asian Americans that know how you feel. Like there was a yeah. part when I was like 11 or 12 at Chinese school and I didn't even fit in in Chinese school. And cause people at Chinese school would be like, he seems black. And so <laughs> I didn't fit in regular school. I didn't fit in Chinese school. It, it was, I was really lost, but uh, a trip to Taiwan when I was 12 really reset me and I learned to be proud cause I saw how hard life was there. And, and I was like, I need to be proud. It's, it, it was a real achievement for my parents to even get here. And um, the thing I want to say, I, I'm losing my train of thought because we're talking about so many things, but um, it's also different for Asian men and Asian women in America. For sure, that's on my list okay. of questions. Well, we'll go to the questions, we'll, we'll go, go to the questions. Well, I mean, well, you touched on something that I also wanted to ask about because you were saying, even growing up, you went to Chinese school. I also went to Chinese school and it was, <laughs> they didn't think that I thought I was black, but they definitely didn't like, I also definitely didn't fit in there. Like I think where you found your sort of subculture and refuge was in hip hop. And for me as a kid, it was in theater. Cause you know, theater people are weird and like crazy and like, you know, they accept a lot of people in theater. Uh, so anyway, I, I, I I'm, I'm bringing this up because I think a big thing that stuck out to me in your book was the difference between mainland Chinese people and American-born Chinese, which is what you and I both are. Um, I think there's a real difference, and I think that often dominant American culture lumps us into the same thing. Um, I think even... Uh, even Chinese culture often lumps us into the same thing. Yet at the same time, when you went over there and you were like with Hakka Heather, um, it seemed to me there was almost a kind of 
when people found out you were American, they valued you as a little higher than them. And I think that is kind of messed up, but what does that say about the institutions of power globally? Yeah, and that's what this book talks about is that around the world in every country, there are quote unquote white people, dominant culture. It's not about skin, it's about social strata and power and monoculture, right? Because whatever is the homogenous monoculture that people are buying into, that becomes a dominant force. And American culture is a dominant force in every country around the world. But, you know, when, when we were just- For what reasons do you think that it is such a dominant force? Because well, I don't think it's, it definitely hasn't been the one that's been around the longest. You, it, that's a very complicated question, but I'm gonna try to answer this one is, <laughs> you know, I, I really feel that part of it is just that America is the number one superpower, it's the strongest economy. When you have the most money, then the production quality of everything you're making is much higher than everywhere else. Like, look at the cameras we have. They don't have these same cameras. Like, I go to China, people are still shooting on like a Panasonic DVX100. You know, that's like the college library camera. And um, also, makeup fashion. You know what I mean? America's at the forefront. You go other places, it's like a high school 80s makeup job that people are doing sometimes. And you know, it's just little things like that just because America's at the top of the food chain with money. Do you know what I mean? And so it's, it's sticky, it's easily consumable. The things that appear on the surface seem much better in American content. But when I was in high school, I started to watch a lot of Taiwanese films, like E.E., e., Eat, Drink, Man, Woman. I would watch Zhang Yimou films. I started looking at it because I was like, hey, there's no Asians in American films besides like Jet Li and then Chow Yun Fat would come over. And I remember when Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon came out, that was like a big thing. But yeah. I got really into international film and I started to realize that you don't need huge production, you don't need the makeup wardrobe and those things. Don't get fooled. Like don't get fooled by the shrubbery, right? And um, I remember that was, that was a line Jamie Foxx had in Booty Call, you know? <laughs> Well, he ordered lobster and there was like a bunch of vegetables and he said, like, you trying to fool a brother with shrubbery. And that's... Ah, yeah. that's a good one. Yeah, and that's how I felt about like American culture that was being exported. It was just all shrubbery. And um, I, I, I think another thing too is like, let's say for Asian, Asian women in America, you feel like, you, you feel like, hey, I could be accepted. I could be part of this monoculture. I could become dominant cultural. Yes, I, I, have, accepted. I have had white friends say to me like, oh, but you're not like those other Asians. Yeah. And in my past days, there was a part of me that was proud of that. Yeah. And I don't like that I was proud of it then because going through this show made me think, what does it say about me? that I'm proud that somebody else has separated me from my community. Well, what does that say about self-loathing and about institutions of power? And this is only very new to me. And so I wanna show it because it's embarrassing, but I think it's true. Well, it's basically dominant culture thirst trapping you. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. just like, hey, yeah, come on over. Yeah, but they let you in. Yeah. They, they let, let you, you in. in the door, but yeah. they, own, they don't let you run the club. No, that you'll never get to run a club. They're definitely thirst trapped. That's why you got to start your own club. Yeah, and it's, it's somatic, you know? Yeah. And, and the thing is that happens is eventually you can try to pass. You know, like Toni Morrison writes about this stuff, passing, right? Yeah. Passing. Mm -hmm. And passing is, it's such a trap because eventually in your life, you can't lie to yourself. You can lie to everybody else but one day you face yourself. And so I used to get upset in high school when there were quote unquote like, you know, Twinkies or things like that and it would yeah. upset me. But Banana. then I got older and I was like, you know what? We're in the same boat. Like I'm into this unity thing. I'm into unity, like let's stick together. We're facing the same problems. And that's what creates community is people with shared problems. And people yes. come to it at different times and people have their solutions and that's what makes you individuals. But make no mistake, Whatever you are, wherever you're from, even if you're a fifth generation American and, and you think you're white, you, you're from somewhere. Mm -hmm. You're from somewhere and you have to explore that and, and that is something that is gonna creep its head up and you're gonna face that. And I love what you said about wherever you come from you have shared problems. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of times 
wanting to be the person who is the exception to the rule and who's like let into the white hierarchies of power. That is you falling for the shrubbery, but not getting the lobster. Yeah, and that's, you know what, that's what I felt about my story being plucked by ABC. It was like, you get to be this person, now you're gonna speak for this community. And I was like, I don't wanna speak for the community. I'm gonna speak for myself, and by doing that and being like 100% true to myself and my experience, I will be doing the best thing for my community. And I constantly deflected like, oh, this book's great or this show's great. I was like, no, there are other people not being represented. Like I'm very focused on the fact that there's only still, you know, th well, there's Ken's show, right? There's the Dr. Ken show. Yeah. And then there's Masters. No, well, we got three this year. So last year was a good year, right? <laughs> there's three. And look, I don't watch any of them, but, <laughs> but it's good. Like, I don't have to agree with people. They don't have to agree with me. But diversity of voice is extremely important. Diversity of voice is extremely, extremely important. And I just want to kick down as many doors as possible. And what, I mean, I have my own answers for why diversity of voice is so important. But I mean, in your book tour and in the people you've talked to, what are some of the, the uh, outcomes, the positive outcomes that you have seen that have been a result of people seeing themselves portrayed on screen or in books or in, in your Vice show? Yeah, well, what you said about what Ta-Nehisi said um, is, is like we teach compliance, we teach conformity. And that just becomes so, e it's so easy if you can teach yourself to like what everybody else likes. But the fact of the matter is, it's all a lie. Like, it's all a lie. Like, we don't all feel the same. We have different taste buds. We hear things differently. We see things differently. We are all so idiosyncratic. And the sooner we embrace that it's okay, the world's gonna be much more interesting. Yeah, and I think not only more interesting, but I think it's Pleasurable, too. Because it's like, why make people feel bad because they have a different opinion of something? Yeah, and, and I do think part of being uh, a, in a non-dominant culture like you and I are, um, you know, dominant culture, not because they have poor intentions, but because they only view us as a group instead of as individuals, it actually decreases their empathy for us because they don't see us as whole individuals. Yeah, they see us as, as types. You're seen as a thing. This yeah. is, that's not a person. It's an Asian person. Yeah. Why is the default for person white? Yeah. Um, and ta I mean, we keep name dropping Ta-Nehisi. I love the interview you had with him. Um, but he was saying that, you know, race is a thing created by white people as a system of power. Because if you think about it, white people don't really have a culture. You, you divide them, they have cultures. Like, there's Italian culture, like Jewish culture, like things like that. But he was saying, whereas like African Americans, we have a rich, beautiful, amazing culture. And the only thing that white people have, whenever you see black people making fun of white people, he's like, what we're making fun of is the fact that all they got is power. Like, yeah, as a collective I will say this. Whole. I will say this, you know what, I, I, I will say this is that, you ever seen that Stanford experiment when they were like, all right, y'all kids are prisoners and y'all are the prison like no, guards, I Please right? There's a Stanford me. thing where they, they said, you're this role, now you're the prison guard, now you guys are the prisoners. And people took on the roles, their personalities changed, and there wasn't the empathy. But that is actually how it's hurting white people as well. They're putting, the system is putting white people into a position of masters. And like, that sucks too. That sucks too. I don't think it's as bad. But it sucks. It sucks it's, too. It's, and it's more also comfortable. An incomplete, but like, if we're gonna speak about it theoretically, philosophically, it's also a very incomplete position. It's a very incomplete yeah. position. And so this system and hierarchy robs everybody. And that's actually what I talk about a lot in the book. Is the love interest Dina is Italian Irish from Scranton, you know? And so there was always me looking at her culture, and I started to realize in a funny way that I had fetishized Italian-American culture. Like, pizzerias, I love pizzerias. <laughs> like, I love Julia Roberts with like the hooker boots and Pretty Woman, you know? I, I watched Mystic Pizza, and then like I remember, I was like, yo, you kinda got sharp features like Julia Roberts, and I was really bout about it. And um, that's what a lot of this book is about, is that your attractions, the things you like, how much of it is actually things that you like and how much of it are right. things you're conditioned to like? Yes. And so 
that was and then to what's, me really interesting to write about. And once you're aware of the conditioning that may have made you think that this person or thing is more attractive, how do you then choose? Like, what part of you chooses? The part that knows that, like, dominant cultures, systemic preferences have made you think, you know, Italian ladies are more attractive, or the part of you that understands that that's sort of a, a, an idea that's been pushed upon you. Yeah, and so what happened when I went to China is I got lost, right? And, and in, the, in the second part of the book, I allow myself to go to China and I get lost. And even though I'm having incredible days at the ends of days or the beginning of days at times, my insecurities would eat me up again. Who am I? Where am I? Who's she? Who's he? You know? And asking myself, am I Chinese? Am I Chinese enough? Will she ever be Chinese? Does she need to be? And I kept asking myself the questions. But then, you know, the book really starts to change when I meet this masseuse, right? And at Noah's Ark, me and my brothers are hanging out at Noah's Ark. And, and, and there's the masseuse there, Wei. And um, she starts to tell me, like, how lucky I am to be born in America. And that just by the sheer fact that I had that mobility and that I was lucky enough to be born in America, that I'm indebted almost to other Chinese people that are born in China that work literally 27 days out of the month, 10, 12 hour days, live at Noah's Ark. This, there was this massage therapist that worked at Noah's Ark. She lived at Noah's Ark and she had three days or four days off each month, depending on what month it was. And three days off an entire month. An entire month. Yeah. And she just sent all the money home so that her parents, who were farmers in the country, could try to buy their house. And she was telling me how lucky I was, and she was able to contextualize it. And that was one of the key moments where I stopped thinking, I stopped second guessing, and I just started living. Because I was like, I'm not just doing it for me. I'm doing it for all the homies that don't have this chance. Well, you know, one of the things I always go back to, um, one of my favorite writers, Marilyn Robinson, also did um, one of these Aloud series. And she did this great interview in the Paris Review where she's like, hey, listen, like, I've been able to be a writer my entire life. I've had running water, clean running water my entire life. Why do I have this privilege that other people maybe, like, Heather, yeah, and you can sit have, there and you can feel guilty about it, or you could just start doing things. For well, people. yeah, what she says, what she says is that the only reason I can see why I have this privilege is that I am under some special obligation to make good use of it. Yeah, and I think that's what you have been doing. Yeah, like I'm trying to do it. That's what you're doing. I hope that's what a lot of these trying. cats out here are doing. Is because yo, it's a privilege to be born in America. This is a superpower of the world. We have the most opportunity. And all we do is bumble fuck it up. We do. <laughs> we just like swallow up resources just for our pleasure and consumption and then don't yeah. make good use of them. Yeah, and I think as liberals, it's not enough to like sit around, eat good food and drink and talk about like how, wow, man, I'm so good, I feel bad and yada, yada. Like I'm really, I don't like that credit card liberals. I just want to do the work. I want to do the work, you know. Um, I want to go back to what you were saying because your, your book is about love and I want to go back to Dina a little bit and also back to your parents. Because um, I know a lot of times, um, you know, when you read books on relationships, which I've done before in my life, um, <laughs> they often say that people who have successful marriages um, usually have good uh, marriage models in the form of their parents. Their parents modeled good, um, good relationships for them. And I know that being Chinese-American, um, and in your book, you have parents that have kind of patriarchal, non-expressive, immigrant models of love versus the models of love that we grew up seeing on television, that we grew up seeing with our next door neighbors, which I think for me is more appealing because it's more expressive. Um, but it, how do you, how, how does that inform how you move forward with relationships? Like, I'm just curious. Because you talk about it. This one is so in hard because, like, I talked to my therapist about this one. Yeah. And he's and you like, you got, no, you got broken models. I know. I, I got it. So I have such respect for you because in your book, like, you call out a lot of the patriarchy in your family. You're feeling bad for your mom having to clean up after your dad's, like, 45 guests. And, you know, these. This one's super hard. Because, huh, it's not only that you have a model that maybe you don't believe in, but then, 
Well, the thing is this, the model that I saw is acceptable and it's the model that there is in Taiwan, right? Um, that's the way love my boat. parents, people do it. That's their generation. Yeah, love boat, right? And then, but you see, you go to your, your, your American friends' houses and they have a different model. And theirs, you're told, is the right model. And yours is the wrong model. And so that's always super confusing. But don't we, as more progressive young people, oh, kind no, no, of yeah. believe that No, 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 that I, want, I want to get to it. Yeah, okay. yeah, I want to get to it. Is that, you know, the thing for me is that I definitely think there are severe problems in not just Asian, but immigrant communities in general, um, low-income communities, whatever, you know. Um, I don't even know if I want to say it's because of that, but there are these, there are families like the one I grew up in where there is a dad who he's the leader, he's the boss, whatever he says goes. And there are times where that dad doesn't feel like he needs to use logic or reason or empathy in making decisions. And then he forces those decisions on other people. On the other side too, there's times where because of that structure, and there were times where even my dad didn't do something, my mom's picking a fight because she just doesn't like the structure of it. But you know, no one taught my dad anything different. But my, my mom always felt like she should be running the family. And at times I agree with her because she was logical and reasonable and she was really sharp. You know, like actually I'll say this. I, I liked that I, I liked a lot of the ways my dad was like keeping us in line at home, but my mom definitely should have run the business. My mom was definitely a really sharp business person. But um I know I'm I'm tap dancing around it because this one's really hard to do with these lights and these people. So I like just Sorry, keep looking at the edge of the Yeah, no, you know, like the violence is where I really drew the line. You know, um, I think when you're a kid and you see your parents fight, um, I, I'm always careful to do this, man. It's I'm not trying to like protect my dad, but like I saw my mom throw boiling hot water at my dad. You know, I've seen her just throw the boiling hot water at him first, and they fight. Of course, my dad always won the fight, and then you always take your mom's side, and you're sad. And my mom, there were times where you know she got beat up. She would take me, she'd put me in the car, and we'd run away to the Red Roof Inn. And she was like, Eddie, I'm leaving your dad. And I was like, where are we going? And it's really hard. And, and she would ask me, what do you want to do? Should we leave? Should we go back? And I was like six. Yeah. You know? And I, I, I didn't know what to say. And this, this went on from the age of, the first time I can really remember it, I was three. Like, I remember the first time, and it's in the first book, is I talk about, my dad flipped the dinner table because he didn't want to drive my mom in the mall. And my mom kept yelling at him and saying it wasn't a man because he didn't want to drive her to the mall. And then I picked up chopsticks because my dad's like, I don't want to fight traffic with you. And I was like, mom, I'll fight traffic with you. And I was like holding these stupid chopsticks thinking like I could fight traffic because I thought traffic was a person. <laughs> but from the age of three to like, 21, it didn't change. That's how my family was. And it's very, you know, I want to be totally open and honest. It's very hard to talk about because, you know, I'm up, I was very upset at my dad and I think he was wrong a lot of the times. I definitely think my mom pushed him a lot to these moments and she almost, in a weird way, like wanted it to happen, expected it to happen, and it was a little sadistic. And I can't psychoanalyze my mom. It's like that's too wild I can. for me. Yeah, um, you can. I know you, why you she can, wanted you to can do try. it. You can try. You can try. But like, I I don't think I can do that. My thing is this: is that this is a hard thing to talk about publicly too, because the public wants to have an opinion. And I was like, you weren't with me shooting in the gym. Yeah. Like you weren't there. And I don't feel like the public should be able to have an opinion about what happened in my house. But I will tell you what I think is that it's fucked up and it shouldn't happen and people shouldn't hit each other and people shouldn't provoke each other to the point of violence. Because like, there is no reason to be violent. Like You yeah. can talk everything out. But violence has become a theme of my life. Violence is something that I've had to really work on getting out of my life because it's all I've known. I mean, you say that people tell you what to feel about these things. Yeah. I think a big part of that, um, I have seen in like just answering Asian American 
centered questions in the past year is that a lot of people want us to make Asian Americans look good. Because a lot of what Hollywood has done is made them just, you know, the clown, essentially. And I really want to commend you because I think, I mean, I mean, we can just tell just from sitting here listening to you now that like talking about this is really difficult. But I think the function of art and literature, or at least for me it always has been, is just to make you feel less alone in the world. Yeah, can and I so me reading about that kind of stuff, being like, oh, this happened to this guy and he turned out okay, but he had these feelings that I had as well, makes you know, those kids reading it or seeing whatever show feel less alone in the world. Yeah, you know, the, the thing that kept me going for a long time is the belief that I was like, I don't think my parents want to do this to each other. I believe my parents love each other and I don't think they want to do this to each other. And as I've gotten older, they stopped and they do love each other and I was like, I feel vindicated. So when I see domestic violence on the street or I see it, and I see it, I see it. Uh, three days ago, I was walking through bed -Stuy. I came out of my friend's crib, and the cops were on the block. And there's five cops pulled up, three cars, and this Mexican boy that lives two doors down from my friend E, um, he was crying, and he was telling the cops, like, why are you guys here? Like, it's a fi why are you here? And the cops were like, tell us what happened, what, what's going on. The neighbor said there was an argument, so we're here. And he's like, yo, it's cool, it's my family. Like, stop, man, like, stop coming. And he was crying because he knew the cops were going to try to take him away. Yeah. And the mom, the dad, the two other kids, they were all huddled and they were, like, really regretful. But these cops wouldn't let it go. And, and it's hard. And I know a lot of times there are these domestic violence moments where, you know what, safety comes first. And you got to protect people. But, like, at least from... My point of view, I was like, this kid's pleading with these cops to be like, look, please don't criminalize this situation. And that's one thing I think families will open up and families will begin to let society into their homes if society is there to help rehabilitate them. But there is a lot of literature and there's a lot of like legislation where it's just like split up the family, divide them, take the wife away, put the dad in jail. And I'm just like, this doesn't help people. In extreme circumstances where safety is a concern, I understand that. But for most circumstances that I've seen and I've lived through, every single one of my best friends in high school grew up with domestic violence. I saw my friend's dad punch him in the face and somebody else had a gun. And like, I was in that room. I was in that room and I saw that and then my friend ran away and he went to high school living in an apartment. And so I've seen all this shit, but like his family got back together. And I don't think I'm very coherent right now because like, I mean, emotional, but my thing is, I just hope that when the system looks at domestic violence, they look at it with an eye towards rehabilitation and not like punitive punishment. Yes. Cause Good. I don't believe families want to beat on each other. That's, and that's a belief I've had that's gotten me through, so. Um, I just want to let you guys know that in uh, about five minutes, I'm going to open it up to a Q&A. Yeah, please, so. somebody, ask somebody else a question. <laughs> so, so, some better questions. So start thinking about your questions now. I think I have one more uh, question for you trying to decide which one you want you want a lighter one easy one easy one <laughs> okay here's one i wrote hmm culture food and its influences we all hate fusion food right but yet we make cherry coke marinated meat and my mom made peanut butter noodles as sort of like you know sesame noodles um how do you personally use food as a way of defining yourself and why do you think food is so often free from scrutiny of ridicule or, as we hear a lot, appropriation. So the, the fusion food thing is, I think the fusion food that most people don't like is when it's just a train wreck. It's like one train is supposed to go this way and this train goes this way and they're like, hey, let's just put these tracks together today and see what happens. And you're like, yo, what? I don't understand this. When I put the cherry cola into the red braised pork, it was because I realized that cola tenderizes meat. And then I also turned down the soy sauce and I pulled out some of the rock candy that I would usually use and I didn't use maltose, right? And so cherry cola has these properties. And I also noticed that a lot of times when people braise pork, they would put in dates and cherry is very similar. So cherry cola was something that replaced and was able to become 
a new twist but filling the same needs for ingredients that were already in this old recipe. Right. And and I also feel like innovation when it's I'll say this for food and this is why I think like at least my use of cherry cola is an appropriation or whatever is somebody asked me recently um what do you what do you how do you feel about political correctness and one uh, a person in one race telling a joke about somebody of another race and i was like when you're gonna tell a joke about another race the key is this it better be a joke that that person finds enjoyment in that that person laughs with before you laugh because if you're telling a joke that you're laughing at that culture then you've crossed the line if you want to tell a joke about another culture, that culture better be laughing first and last. And I think with food, the thing is, is that if you're going to evolve it and you're going to change it, it better be serving the palate that that came from, the and native palate. That's what I think I try to stay true to. Because I think you get asked a lot about appropriation, and I do too with our show. And the thing I've come to with like satisfying that palate is it's kind of about respect. Like you talk about hip hop, but you have a deep understanding and respect and awareness of the history of it that I cannot even begin to touch. Well, it's not American, like you're like yeah. Kylie Jenner putting cornrows in her hair yeah. and saying it's just a hairdo. Yeah, and I think the thing that I, the best way I can explain like my relationship to black culture is that at least my American values that I have, they come predominantly, almost exclusively from black literature, black culture, hip hop, basketball, things like that. I develop my value system. So the way that I operate, the way that I write, the, the way that I make decisions based on values, it's very true to the value system that hip hop came out of. And that's why, you know, like I go on Hot 97 and nobody's asking me appropriation, co-optation questions. They just, they get it. People in the neighborhood didn't know me they for know a long time. They know you get it. Yeah. And I love that quote in your book. I didn't I wish I had written it down, but something like when you're a cotton mouth traveler in the desert and you come across this oasis of hip hop, water is water. There wasn't a yeah. lot of identity for you or, or culture for yeah. you to identify with growing up in the nineties without the internet in Orlando. Yeah, I love that. Water quote. is water. You're it's totally right. It was I felt like a traveler in the desert in America without anybody representing me that was similar to me or similar to my values. And the first thing I saw was like Barry Gordy, The Last Dragon, Saturday when they played that movie all the time at 2 p.m. Yeah. I saw hip hop, I saw basketball, and I, I saw Charles Barkley and Huckleberry Finn, and I was like, yo, I relate to this. this I is saw water. theater geeks. Yeah. I was like, I relate to this. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you, and, and that's how you form your identity and form your values, and you know what? Like, I hope that we reach a time and a place where it's, it's not like, oh, you're this race, you can't understand this or you can't do that it's like i hope that we start from equal places where I, somebody told me the goal of feminism was equal opportunity for equal work for equal pay and if we can reach that for all people then we can start to dabble in each other's shit you know yeah. all right that's that's a good way to end though let's um thank you how you guys doing hi how are you <laughs> hey uh so my question is about um in the literary world um, I don't really see a lot of other Asian American writers out there right now. You know, like writing your type of your type of honest story. It's usually just like you know fictional writers, not a lot of non-fictional writers. How do you feel about the current like literary environment? Is that there's no like you know more non-fiction writers out there? Uh, you know, I actually read a lot of Asian writers. You know, like uh, is that Ol is that Oliver here? Is that Oliver? No. Well, no. I mean, there's there's a lot of writers. This. Dude, Oliver Wang, he's, I, 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 I was reading his stuff in college, and he lives in L.A. Jay Caspian Kang is a writer that I read. Um, Hua Xu, there's Chairman Mao. You know, you ever read that hip-hop magazine, Ego Trip? Uh, no, I don't no, think I've read Check out Ego Trip. Okay. It's fly. Chairman Mao is this dude that, um, he was one of the founders of Ego Trip, and then Ego Trip produced that show, The White Rapper Show. Oh, oh okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so Chairman Mao, and he used to throw this epic party in New York at APT, it was fly. But uh, who else? There's a lot of writers, you know? There's Maxine Hong Kingston, like you said. He was saying a lot of nonfiction. Yeah, nonfiction, yeah, Wesley Yang. Wesley okay. Yang is a oh, good writer. Oh, Wesley Yang is get great. You know? I'm really obsessed with this writer now named Jenny Zhang. Okay. Yeah, there's she's, a lot of really writers, good. there's a lot of writers coming up. I mean, Asa Akira's coming out with another book. I like Asa. Yeah. Oh, and you know, 
That's why you should buy this yeah. book. Yeah, the Asa bought this book too. You should no, you should buy this book because I think you know there are Asian American writers out there, but maybe they're not getting just like Asian American actors aren't getting as many parts. Yeah, and I don't mean to disagree with you. Audience. If you're not yeah, seeing no, it, I mean, if you're not seeing yeah. it, it's just they are. It's hard to find. Like you know, sure. it's not like uh, the internet's just putting it out in front of you. But they're yeah. out there, man. They're yeah. out there. And I think that there are a lot of Asian American journalists really doing their thing. Yeah, Wesley Yang is a good one. Yeah, he's real smart. Yeah. Well, I, I just think you, you put a really good voice and attention to like you know, Asian American writers. Appreciate that. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, my friend Mary Choi. She's a good writer too. You read Mary H. K. Choi. She's good. Hey oh guys. wow! Hey. You're hitting us from both sides. <laughs> Uh, my question is actually for both of you, because uh, you guys have a lot of similarities. You're both Taiwanese, Chinese American, who kind of grew up in Virginia around the same time. But there's a significant difference. Same that, age. That, <laughs> yeah, that that relates to gender, you know, because I think that's something yeah. you guys were going to talk about. Is and I was wondering how do the differing portrayals of Asian American women versus Asian American men in me in media, how has that sort of impacted your individual experiences, you know, as you're coming up and, and even now? You go, you go first. Well, I mean, just in the, you know, film and TV perspective, obviously I've thought more about Asian American women because that's my experience, but in reading um, interviews of other people, men, I find that a great deal of their concern is that they feel emasculated by um, dominant culture. Um, whereas I think oftentimes the place where Asian American women get a pass, pass, because we're often fetishized and almost to our own detriment because, you know, we're all human. Human people like to be admired for their beauty. It's, that's a very normal reaction. But once you get that and you realize that that experience is very empty and you want actual substance, um, that has informed my choices in that I'm not interested in like doing super feminine, pretty, you know, sweet romantic roles. I'm kind of interested in showing the dirty side, like the embarrassing side. I mean, you in your book, you talk about how you almost forced, you kind of forced intimacy with Dina by like watching her take a shit. But that's like the real, that's, but that's how intimacy is formed, you know? She, by the way, he yeah, talks about poop a lot in the book. <laughs> But like, it, 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 it furthers the narrative. Yes. It furthers the narrative. Something but, about having to clean your socks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, the, the thing is, though, is it's like, it's a trap door if you let people like you for something superficial, like looks. Do you know what I mean? It's a trap door. It's a trap door. It's an appealing trap, but it's something that I have had to consciously ignore. And also, when another woman does that, not to judge her for it and to almost love her with it because um, I feel like there's a lot of competition and jealousy and stuff with women in general. Um, and the only way to stop it is just by just stop doing it. Yeah, I will say this. I think that for minorities, anybody who's different, whether it's different because of your gender or sexuality or, or wherever you're from, um, you don't get to be a complete human being in, in, the, in these societies. And so they'll like you for this thing and they won't like you for another thing. But you can't, I think that the, the biggest mistake is to say, don't like me for my looks. Don't like me for this. That's a weapon at your disposal. You know what? If that person's going to like you and they're going to trust you and they're going to buy your product because of that, play it against them. Use it. Use it. Like people assume that I could cook food because I'm Asian. Do you know what I mean? Like, but use it for you, I not for them. I could have made mad stories you up about like bows and people would have believed me. Like, like David Chang did, you know? <laughs> oh. But, you know, I you can... Say that. True story. But <laughs> I think you... I, th I think when you are the underdog, I think when you are fragmented, you have to take, take the things that people think about you and play it against them back, right? Yeah. So if they're going to consider... They're going to assume that it's a strength of yours, like, fine, you know? Use it for your advantage, though, not for them. That's yeah, no, saying. use it. You know it and use it. Know it. Yeah. Know it and use it. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Next question. Right it's like Harry Potter. Harry Potter, he can't help it. He's like Gryffindor, but then he's also like, he got a little dark side in him, but he makes, <laughs> makes it. He makes Frodo it. Frodo in the him. ring. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you got to make it work for you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't so, even know if that makes sense. Frodo in the ring? I don't know. Anyway, I, I, my I precious, wasn't a Lord of Rings dude. I was a Harry Potter dude. What's your question? <laughs> I'm excited to read your book and hear how you're exploring your relationship with a white woman because I think it's another kind of intimate topic you're covering in the book. And I feel like for people of color in America, it can sometimes be seen as a statement or a certain loaded choice whether you date a white person or someone from your same ethnic background. So I think the answer is different for each person, but I'm curious to hear your reflections on what did that feel like? What did you learn about yourself you know, being in a relationship with a white woman, seeing how you were judged and, and or not, and how did that feel? That's a tough one too. It's, it's, it's a roller coaster of emotions. You start to realize things like even a, uh, you know, there were Asian guys and Asian women that would, would if, if my girl went to the bathroom, they'd be like, yo, you kung fu, like, you kung fu and li hai. Do you know what I mean? Like, Swan sang kung fu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, wow, kung fu and li hai. Saying like, Wow, skills you did. Are very strong. Like your skills are strong. You yeah. got this girl, you know, <laughs> and um, it was always a kind of thing like you calm down, calm down, you know. But um, no, there is a. It's it's like I do think that people. I'll speak for myself. I I do think there were times where you're like, I got a white girl. Look at me, you know. <laughs> But if you ever level with yourself and you're honest, you're like, man, I love this person. Why would I think about them? This And you know, this was one thing. I really love this girl. I love this girl. And so the first couple months, I saw her as a thing at times, just like other people have seen me as a thing. And I think it's a very difficult thing not to do when you're of different races. But then I, I said that, I remember consciously saying to myself at one point, and it was during Hurricane Sandy, I was like, I love this person, and if I love this person, I'm not gonna do what people have done to me. I'm gonna treat her the way I've always wanted to be treated. I'm gonna treat her like a whole human being and see her that way and understand her that way. I'm gonna work towards this. And so I'm not gonna tell these cheap jokes, and I'm not gonna let other people tell the cheap jokes. And I didn't get militant about it. It was just like, if somebody said it, I'd like ease them out and ch change the conversation. Because I don't think it's ill-intentioned. I don't think it's ill-intentioned. This is the kind of matrix that we've been put in, and it's unfortunate, but like we slowly untangle it. What about you, you wanna talk about Constance? Cause you know, no. Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting cause you say you didn't wanna, you know, you like, if your friends say something that you're like chill out. I mean, I, I had an agent tell me that like, an Asian agent tell me that dating a white person was how you move up. And so I fired him. That's good, good. But to a lot of people, I mean, you said to the question before, you said, you said, um, you know, if you have these skills, use them. Like, don't be like, oh, don't love me because I'm pretty, love me because I'm smart, whatever. I mean, a lot of people would have said, why are you gonna fire that agent? That's a very high powered agent. This is, that's a foolish move. You might never get to be at that agency again. And I was just like, because it's, I don't want that person representing me and I don't want to encourage that type of uh, dialogue as something that's like cool and exclusive and that like yeah. we could be chummy chummy and say that kind of no, shit No, yeah, too. that's different. That's a calculation you're making. You know what I mean? Like that, that guy's just a terrible man. <laughs> you know, that, that's terrible. I mean, I don't know how you make that work for you. I mean, but, but I've definitely been in circles before where, you know, how li hai, you know, like, you, it's almost a status symbol, and when it's your peers and your friends, obviously none of our friends are perfect. We ourselves are not perfect. Not encouraging that type of, um, without having to lecture every time you're like chilling with your friends. Yeah, I, I try not to do the lecture thing. It also, you know where it's coming from. You yeah. know where it's coming from, but like you don't want to play their, it It's their it. bastardized way of being like, good job, buddy. You know, yeah, like yeah, trying yeah. to praise you, but yeah, it's the yeah. wrong praise. Yeah. Human panda in the house. What's up? Um, real quick, a joke. Uh, since you talk about poop a lot on this, you should have called it two, two cups, one girl. Oh, man. <laughs> jokes, jokes. All right, so um, <laughs> question is, um, so you, you're pretty, you're like the renaissance man. You do like food, you do dope shit, no matter what you do, all right? Whatever you turn, touch turns into gold. So when you do these things, do you have a different message for each thing that you do, or do you have a, an overarching message that you want everybody to get? 
I think I'm saying the same thing better and better each time. That's what I try to do, you know? And like, there was a, you know, this this woman, Wei Cho, I, I can't pronounce, I've never met her, so I don't know how to pronounce her name. That's the only reason I'm saying it, Wei Cho. But like, um, she wrote this really cool article looking at everything I've done over the last six, seven, excuse me, years, and showing how they all work together. And when I started Bauhaus, I wanted to say the same things I'm saying now at this you know, event and in this book, which is about shared problems create community. Individuals are made when you create your own solutions. And then also things like people are much more similar than they are different. And these are the, and treat each other like you want to be treated, it's a golden rule, like everybody's written about this in every generation. And I think that people just have to explore these, I wanted to explore these themes, but it was never able to be complete at Bauhaus. And then I wrote Fresh Off the Boat and I wasn't the writer that I am today. And then, you know, we went to ABC and you know, the network did what they did and so we weren't able to tell it fully there. But each way, it's like we dropped kernels of information and crumbs. And throughout all the projects, it culminates in one story. It's my story of being an Asian in America and how it felt in the experience. And I think that this book, and also after you finish this book, I wrote an epilogue and it's online. And I think I'm, only, I'm the, probably the only dumbass that would put the, put the, the end of the book online. Yeah, I need but to read that. The end of the book is online. Uh, <laughs> I end this book where I want it to end, but there are things that people will think about and ask and want to know, and so that's why I wrote an epilogue. But um, I think this is probably the end of me talking about my personal story, and um, I'm very happy to complete it with this book and that epilogue. Um, it's fragmented because that's, you know, I wasn't given a platform to totally speak my mind, and I also didn't have all the skills in the beginning. But I think if you look at Bauhaus, Fresh Out the Boat, the ABC show, Wong's World on Vice, and then this book, Double Cup Love, that's the story, you know? And um, so people may see it as Renaissance stuff, and, and it is. I have different mediums that I use, but I, I use them because I felt like they filled out the story and it was able to show a complete spectrum. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You know, you hear that talk about like, when's your best work? Is it, and every artist says, oh, it's the one I'm gonna do, or it's something. So I just wanna ask both of you, like, how you stay like inspired and like, do you, like one, do you truly believe that your best work is only like in those, the, the limited time that you have? Or, and then two, do you think like your, like your best work is ahead of you? Or like, how do you, or no, my second part is like, how you stay inspired and keep creating what you do when you're doing. You know, my, my thing is this, there are times where you think about stuff like that and it's because somebody else put that stupid idea in your head, <laughs> you know? Uh, my favorite director is Woody Allen, right? You look at Woody Allen, man, any, any hall in Manhattan, that's probably, everybody points to those probably his two best films, but look at his last 10, 15 years. Like from Midnight in Paris to now, this might be his most productive era, movie to movie to movie, you know? Um, he's been incredible, and he's like, what, like 80 something now, right? He's old as hell. And, <laughs> and so, I think that you can be productive at any time. It's just like, are you willing to keep learning? I think the issue is, is that like a lot of times, it's not that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. A dog has survived and it's done what it's done, and it's like, I don't wanna learn anymore. I don't wanna keep reinventing myself or keep challenging myself, but like at least personally for me, I've already written like my next screenplay that I'm doing. I, I have ideas of what I wanna do. Uh, and I'm challenging myself and I'm accepting the person that I am and accepting the new challenges. So I'm not worried, you know, I'm, I'm not worried. I mean, you say, you, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I, for me, I have found that my best work, um, cause it is, you can <laughs> teach a dog new tricks, but not if the dog doesn't have to learn them because they have all the comforts of whatever. Yeah, if you and keep getting roles that you just can knock dead and you've already done yeah, the work yeah, before. Yeah, and you're not just not yeah. being challenged and not just in the roles you get, but in your life. I think my best work has always come, honestly, out of suffering. 
Um, and not because anything necessarily happened, but because when you are dead broke, you got nothing, you're like single, you're lonely, you know, you don't have money to go like buy a pair of shoes to make you feel better. The only thing that you can do to make yourself kind of feel better is to learn how to generate meaning from within. And for me, that was always through my work. And when I decided a few years ago when I was dead broke that, you know what, I am going to stick with acting, even if I have to be a waitress when I'm 45. I'm OK with that, because if I like make a web series with my friends or I like go to my acting coach and you know work on a great scene, even if no one ever sees it, the work that I did exploring that character or that story generated enough meaning for me that I don't need to go get more stuff. So my newest challenge is now that I have the ability to get stuff, not to, you know, not to, to still be learning new, be a dog learning new tricks. Um, so, and, and that's hard. Yeah, just don't be afraid to do the work again. Yeah, don't be afraid to do a work again. And when somebody challenges you, um, Personally, it's very easy to get defensive. Like once you did you've with done the it, book. right? And you go see a studio apartment, like you're like, oh, I gotta live in this thing again. Yeah. You know, but, but like I still share an apartment with my brother in New York. It's so grimy. It's terrible. And but but then you, know you got what? less to lose. I do really good writing there, so you know it's it works. But then I'm it's nice. I have a nicer place here that he's not allowed to come to. <laughs> we never talked about the brother Thank stuff you. living together in the book. That was good. Well, they'll read anyway. It. Sorry. Yeah, you guys gotta read it, it's good. Eddie. What's up? What's up, man? Okay, so you're a hip hop head. I think and so. you're a writer. So have you ever entertained the thought of maybe, instead of next time picking up your pen to write a book, um, pick up your pen to write some bars or something like that? Has that ever crossed your mind? Well, you know, the, the thing that I'm doing for the next book is because I, in my, I, I would never go be a rapper, you know, like not that, I mean, I think it's incredible, but I, I'm kind of old, right? <laughs> um, you know, the easy way to catch a brick is a career at 34, you know? But <laughs> no, the next book, the next book I'm writing, and I already started it, and I'm working with Chris Jackson on it, is like my idea of like what would be the next great hip hop album that the game needs. And it's just like I'm writing 10 chapters of like what I would want to see is like the next Illmatic and it's fictional. So I'm just doing that for fun. You know, I'm doing that for fun and we'll see what happens. But, you know, because I mean, I, I learn everything from music. So I, it's just like I'm, I'm starting writing 10 chapters. Every chapter is a song and it's about like what I really think like the game needs. Do you find that American Asians are a little bit more welcoming or m more hypercritical of you because at first I was like, oh yeah, Asians, and then you had an accent on the show, so I don't know what you. Well, I, I didn't, I had to think about that and think about the fact that there is nothing inherently shameful about an accent. It means you know two languages. And the institutions that have made us think accents are shameful are actually to blame. Um, and that is Hollywood like always using it as like this humor tool instead of giving a person a full story. And as in terms of whether I thought American-born Chinese, I don't, I'm not sure what you mean by higher level or lower level, like our show. Just like, you know, we don't want all of dominant culture to say we are one thing, the reaction is also very multifaceted. There are some who still cringe at my portrayal because they only look at snippets of it and they think those loud pieces represent the whole. And when I do my performance, I make it a whole journey. It's very important to me to do so. And so then there are some American-born Chinese who love it, and they love that it is American, and that we have subtle ways that we defy stereotype, like the fact that Jessica's really into Stephen King. That's not an Asian-American stereotype, but it's a very true-to-character thing. Um, so it's kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't, because right. some people are like, oh, my parents don't kiss like that. Oh, but my parents do do that. Why aren't you doing that? So. You know, we just got to focus on the work and making it good. And some of the reaction is going to be good. Some is going to be bad. But you got to be true to you. The, the, the ones that drive me crazy, there are people who feel like they want to control or say how Asians act. And I'm like, you're silly because everybody acts different. Like, you just have to accept that we are all different, but we have shared problems. And that's the one thing we have in common. But how we deal with it and how we talk and how we accent and how we eat is our own decision. And so yeah. I just get really annoyed when there are Asian people that try to judge us on Asian-ness. 
you know? Totally. And my thing with the book, I mean, my thing with the ABC show was I was like, if it is specific to one person and idiosyncratic, then it can be symbolic of how we are all idiosyncratic and specific. Instead of trying to say, this is how we all are. Like, to even attempt to be, like, the most Asian person, like, Jesus Christ, you That's need like hobbies. The, yeah. You need hobbies. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.